yet another idea of the impartation of the Spirit. Now, the, the most important part of receiving God's Spirit is that our lives will be transformed. You can be happy, you can be joyful, etc., for moments at a time, but when it's something that is long-lasting, it's something that becomes part of who you are, you're a Christian down to the core. You believe, you understand, you've been transformed, you've been uh, brought to the point where you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You follow him regularly. That's what we're looking for. We want the real-life experience of actually being a Christian. And so that's what we're looking at right now, especially at the end of time. We believe that we are living right near the time of the close of probation. Uh, following will be the coming of Jesus. And we want to be prepared for that time where the decisions have been made. He that is just, let him be just still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. So what we have is the idea that the Bible makes it clear that we have a, a method by which God will seal his people. The sealing is extremely important to understand because it's, it's almost like if you've ever sealed fruit into a container, it's called canning here in America. You could call it bottling, or I think that's what it's called in Australia. Different things in different locations. But if you take and preserve some fruit in a, in a container, first that container has to be really clean, right? Clean on the outside, clean on the inside, especially on the inside. You boil the fruit, get it warm, get it to the point where it's going to cut off or, or kill any kind of bacteria. You put it in there, you heat it very hot so that it will bring all the oxygen out of that container, and then the cap that you put on there actually seals, and you're able to store that for years to come. It is now sealed. Nothing good comes out, nothing bad goes in. So that's the idea of sealing, and that's kind of what happens with what God is doing through his um, truth, through his ministry, through his spirit. He wants us to be sealed in such a way having been imparted the Spirit in such a way that we have made our decisions, we've made up our mind, we are concluded that we want to be with God. We want to be with His Son, we want to be ministers with the holy angels, and we want to be with the saints that want to do the same thing. When you've come to that point, you are sealed, and God will enable you to be finally brought into heaven. So the idea of the sealing, especially at the end of time, is what we're going to be looking at now in the next few minutes. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to be able to see what it is that the Bible is teaching here in regard to the sealing. So in John chapter 6, verse 27, labor not for the meat. Now this, this word actually doesn't mean flesh. It means something that you eat. It's food, okay? And something that you would, you know, by extension, put in your mouth and, and chew up. So don't labor for the food which perishes. We know what happens when food perishes. It's just like those that don't believe in the Son of God, they will perish rather than have everlasting life. It's the same thing. You don't exist any longer, like food which perishes. Okay, but for that food which endures, so don't labor for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures unto everlasting life, which the who? The Son of Man shall give unto you. Now, I thought the Holy Spirit was the one that gives us eternal life, right? Right. It's the Son of Man. It's the Spirit of the Son of Man. In fact, we haven't even looked at that yet. I'm going to look at Galatians 4, verse 6. Because you are sons, you are God's children, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, up here in verse 4, God sent forth His Son. Okay? In verse 6, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son. So God sent his son, and then the spirit of his son. God did not send somebody else. And so when it says here in John chapter 6, verse 27, the Son of Man will give this life unto you, it's because it's his spirit that gives you that life, right? Now notice what it says next. For him, which is the Son of Man, him hath God the Father sealed. Oh, I like that. God the Father sealed his son. Now, 
the word sealed, if you look up the Greek, it actually means to put a stamp on something, somewhat similar to the Roman kind of stamp or seal that you probably are aware of. There would be clay that would be melted upon a, um, a piece of paper like papyrus or, or some kind of paper that they would use and roll up, and that wax would be put on the end of that roll, so that if you're rolling a piece of paper, the end of that roll is where the wax would be poured on, and then the king or whoever it was that was kind of signing it, they would put their stamp on it, and that seal could not be broken until it was given over to the person who was to break it and then be able to read it. Now, if that seal had been broken, you know that it was not a private letter. Somebody has been in there and has looked into it, right? So it was very important to be a courier, somebody who would take that message from one location to the other, because if that letter was opened, guess who would lose their life? Well, the courier would, right? Because the courier knows now the important information in that letter, and somebody's got to lose their head. So it's really important that the seal would be the, st the seal of the king, the seal of the prince, the seal of whomever it was that put their seal on it. So here, God the Father has sealed his son. Oh, I love it. So now, do you want the seal of God on you? Well, I want it on me. I really do. I mean, I, I truly want the seal of God on me. I want my family to have it. I want you to have it. I want God to place his stamp of approval on my life. Okay? So that's where I'm at, and I hope that you're the same. Anyways, going back to the Bible here, it says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21. Oh, by the way, this verse is really important because if the Bible says Christ in you is the hope of glory, and God the Father has sealed that Christ in you, then when you're sealed, it's because Christ is sealed within you, okay? It's not really you that gets the seal necessarily. It's the Spirit of Christ that goes to heaven, not your spirit that goes to heaven, okay? It's, it's all of Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not you in you believing in Christ, which is the hope of glory, okay? So now in verse 121 of 2 Corinthians, now, now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Now, this is really important because this word establisheth, what does it mean? To stabilitate, to confirm, okay? If you're stable, so that the root word of this would be stable, to stabilitate, it means you are firm, you're on a strong foundation. Like you put your house upon the sand, and the winds will blow, and the waves will come, and the house will fall. But if the house is upon a rock, then the winds will blow, and the waves will come, and that house isn't going anywhere because it's founded upon a rock. You can ask Jesus about that in Matthew chapter 7. But right here, it's saying that the one who stabilitated us, the one who confirmed us, the one who has established us, as it says, with you are the one who establishes us with you in Christ and who has anointed us is God. Now, if you want to look up that word right there, anointed, it's really interesting because the one who anoints, in the, when you use this Greek word, is God. Amen. Okay. So, he which has brought you to a firm foundation, you are established, you're confirmed, you are strong. And you're with us because we're the Christians, you know, like we're the apostles and those that are working for the Lord. But it's us with you in Christ. Just like it said, because the Son of Man hath God the Father sealed. It's got to be in Christ. If you're established in Christ and you're anointed, it's because God has done that. I love it. It's so beautiful. God has anointed us. That's what it says. He has anointed us. Us. Who's the us? That's you and me. Anybody reading this? That's us. So 1 verse 22, it says, Who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And so wait a minute. God has established us. He's anointed us. And he sealed us. Whoa. I like that. Because God the Father is the one that does it through or for his Son as well, the Son of Man. God the Father sealed well, I could say God the Father established his son, anointed his son, and also sealed his son. 
But what it's saying here is that you're established, anointed, and sealed by God also. I think that's absolutely beautiful. I mean, what do you think? Is that a beautiful truth to you? Does that inspire you? Does that give you some kind of desire to serve the Lord even better? Because he's the one that's taking care of you. This is God we're talking about. This is the only true God. This is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ as well. You can read about that in Ephesians. And so when we're looking at these verses, to me, this is amazing. It's just beautiful that we can see these things. So going on further in Ephesians 1 verses 12 and 13, it says that we should be, that's you and I, that's anybody reading this, the Christians, that we should be to the praise of God the Father's glory, who first trusted in Christ. Okay, so if you've trusted in Christ, you are going to be to the praise of God's glory. Why? Because God sent his son. You can read about that in John chapter 3, verses 16 and onward. But here in verse 13, in whom you also trusted after, not before, but after you heard the word of truth. Now remember, the words that I speak unto you are what? Spirit and life. So could you say, after that you heard the spirit of truth? Well, wait a minute. Who had the spirit of truth? It was Jesus. Jesus had the spirit of truth. And that's the spirit that he's going to send after he appeals to his father. It's the spirit of truth. It's the comforter. It's his spirit, right? So after you've heard the word or spirit of truth, you've trusted. It's actually the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, wait a minute. Sealed? Past tense? Who is this talking to? Friends, this is talking to the Ephesians. Now, as far as I know, the Ephesians were written to almost 2,000 years ago. Are you saying that this part of the scripture didn't apply to them because they're not part of the 144,000 and that's the real sealing? Oh, no. You see, they, according to this verse, were sealed. That's past tense. They entered into believing the gospel, receiving it. They were to the praise of the glory of God because they trusted in Christ. As a result of trusting in Christ, they were sealed, past tense. And so we too right now can be sealed. Now, what does that mean? Is, is that the same thing as the 144,000 being sealed? No, I don't think so. There are different ways that you can understand the sealing process, okay? Remember when it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Okay, wait a minute, really? I'm supposed to be that perfect? Well, yes. Why? How? Well, because it's God that does it for you, right? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it is God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God working in you. It's, it's the co-working together. And so what's happening is, if you're sealed, if you've believed, if you have the Son of God in your life, if you have trusted, if you've yielded yourself over and you're willing to receive what it is that's called the Word of Truth or the Spirit of Truth, you're in. And so if you have this experience, then you can be sealed past tense, but there is a special group at the end of time. That special group at the end of time will have understood what God has tried to reveal to this world. There is going to be an outpouring that was greater than the early rain. This is the latter rain. The latter rain is going to be ten times more powerful, according to inspiration. But also, in the Bible, you can see that as well. You can see it in Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. You can see it in Joel. You can see it in other places like that. The latter rain is going to be really powerful. All the world will be filled with the glory of the angel that comes down in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. It wasn't all the world that was filled there in the early rain. The early rain got the message, but this one is talked about differently, okay? So what we have is a really powerful latter rain. And there's a comment here that I'm going to take. It says, Satan wants to hinder this work. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's right. And certainly it's an angel trying to... Uh, divert God's plans. We'll talk about that in just a minute. 
But what we're seeing is that at the end of time with that 144,000, that is a special group. That is a group that is actually ready for the harvest. Now, in Mark chapter 4, you can see that Jesus says, when there is a seed that is planted, the bud is perfect, just as it should be. The leaf is perfect, just as it should be. Well, the corn is perfect as well. So anywhere that is, whether a seed that's out of the ground, perfect. If it's in the ground, it's rotting, it's starting to die, perfect. If it's sprouting up a little bit, perfect. If it's growing bigger, perfect. If it's ready to harvest, perfect. Now, at the end of time, God's people are going to be ready to harvest. So far, we have been partaking of the early rain. The early rain is to produce the bud, or the, the stem, and then the stalk, and then the bud. And so what we're having is this early rain experience. Pretty soon, though, God is going to have a people that are ready for the harvest. That is a different kind of sealing. Now, there is, it's the same thing. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But that's a different context, okay? So don't be confused that that has to be the 144,000. Nobody else is sealed in the Bible. That's not true. It's not, it's not even true at all. So now, going back to the Bible, let's try to understand here. It says in one more verse that I'm going to be looking at here, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So you're sealed by the Spirit, okay? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby, this is, this word here is denoting position and, let's see, relation or of rest, uh, let's see, um, after, you are sealed after the Holy Spirit, altogether, among, before, between, by, or hereby, that's why, it's, that's where it says whereby, and we're going to see that, uh, oh, lots of different translations. There's a lot of idioms on this one, too. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby. Now, when we use that term in English, I'm going to go to the store. You could say, and it's not common, but you could say, whereby. I could say, well, I'm going to drive the car to the store. You could say, I'm going to go to the store, whereby. I'm going to walk to the store. I'm going to go to the store, whereby? I'm going to ride my bicycle to the store. So it's, it's a means by which, okay? So when you say whereby, you're actually asking or stating the means by which something is going to happen. So let's look at it that way again. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So it's the Holy Spirit that seals us. Amen? Yes or no? Amen. I didn't see you because I'm sharing my screen, but the point is, amen. That's what it says. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that seals us unto the day of redemption. Now, let's go to our next couple of sections of the Bible. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 9. He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge. Now, my Bible says that God sends his angels to have charge over you. You can read it in Psalm 91, verse 11. Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. So behold, there were six men that came from the way of the higher gate, which lies toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen. Now, we know that pure and white linen, according to the book of Revelation, is the righteousness of the saints, right? Well, he had a writer's inkhorn by his side. What do you do with a writer's inkhorn? Well, that's like you take your pen out, you stick it in the inkhorn, and you write something. Let's see what we have here. I'm going to make this a little bigger. And uh, let's see. I guess I'll read it. Friends, uh, who of you will not forsake the world and receive the seal of God in your foreheads and incur the wrath of the beast for the privilege of being among the 144,000? It is a glorious privilege, one that no other can have. No wonder, then, that those who live in the time of the end are called blessed. But how few esteem these favors. Two marks are before us, both to be in the forehead. One is God's, the other is the beast's. Which will you choose? Take God's, and he will deliver you in the time of trouble soon coming on the earth, and give you a place among the 144,000. 
Choose the beasts, and you must suffer the wrath of God. May you choose the better part and stand with the saints on Mount Zion. Amen. I would be willing to bet that's Jones, because it does not sound like the writing of Ellen White. Thank you so much. So it says, Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lies toward the north, and every man a slaughterer weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, which is the writer's inkhorn. That's what you write with. The You stip, stick the pen in the inkhorn, which is by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. The brazen altar, that's outside of the holy place or most holy place. That's the brazen altar. What is the brazen altar for? The brazen altar is actually for sacrifice. Okay, that's what it's for. That's where the Lamb of God was slain out in the sanctuary. It was on the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. So the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. So the glory of God was taken off the cherub whereupon he was. So God, it sounds like, was riding on a cherub just like he had done before. We can see that in like Psalm 104, Psalm 18, etc. Whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by its side. And he said unto him, Go, go through the midst of the city. What city is that? Well, remember in the first couple of verses there, it was in that holy city, wasn't it? It was, where does it say that? Mm, I'm missing it. Charge over the It doesn't say holy city, it just says the, the city. And it says, go throughout the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. That's where it is. I, was, I knew it said it somewhere. Through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that do what? That sin? No, no. That sigh and that cry because of the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So these people were supposed to have a mark upon their foreheads. Now these people were the ones who were actually sighing and crying because of the abominations. Not in concert with them, but because of them. That be done in the midst of that city, which was in Jerusalem. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite let not your ears spare, sorry, let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But do not come near any man upon whom is the mark. What mark? Well, the mark that it was upon those who sigh and cry after the abominations that are done, right? And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, because they have the most responsibilities. They're the elders of the church, which were before the house. And it was those 25 that we read in the previous chapter, by the way. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left that I felt upon my face, I fell rather upon my face, and cried and said, Ah, oh, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Now, how does God pour out his fury? You can read about that in Revelation 16. It's actually through the angels. So wait, are you going to pour out your fury upon all of the rest of Israel, like everybody in Jerusalem? Will there be anybody left? Then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord does not see us. And as for me also, mine eye will not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had an inkhorn by its side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Wow. What's happening here? These men are actually angels. The angels have received a command from God. Some of them have slaughtering weapons. One of them has an inkhorn. That one that has an inkhorn goes and writes something, some kind of mark on the name of the forehead of those that are sighing and crying after the abominations that have been done in Jerusalem. And so what happens is, when they are finished slaying and marking, 
They come back and report to God, we are finished. Why? Because they have received the command. They have descended upon that ladder, which is Christ, the only mediator between heaven and earth. They have done their commission, and they have returned with a report of their work being accomplished. This is descending and ascending upon the ladder. Now, what we can see is a message that comes from the Father, through the Son, through the angels, upon those that are sighing and crying, and also those that are not. And then it's brought back up that same ladder. Here we have the science of the network of what we've talked about last time. But there's another scripture here that we want to look at real quick, just to clarify. This, by the way, Ezekiel 9, is at the end of time. This other one also is at the end of time. We're going to be trying to understand a little bit more with clear English writing who it is that puts the mark upon the forehead. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, remember, that the Spirit of God is whereby the mark is put upon his people, right? Let's continue this for a second. It says in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 7, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on any, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. So an angel is with these four angels, and this one, the fifth one, has the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels. So he actually has a voice, and it's an angel, right? The angel cries out with a loud voice to the other four angels, who was given it, whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And this fifth angel was the one saying to the four angels, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we, till we, say it again, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Whoa, wait a minute. Okay, I just read that there were four angels. There was another angel which was speaking to those four angels. And all of these five angels together were saying that they were not to hurt the earth, the sea, or the trees until they have sealed the servants. That's exactly what happened in Ezekiel chapter 9. There were angels that were sent forth, except there were five of them with the slaughtering weapons and then one with the inkhorn. Here, there are four holding back the winds of strife, and there's one that cries out to those four. So in Ezekiel, there's six. Over here, there's five. And we can see that the angels are responsible, physically responsible, for putting a mark on the forehead of God's people. A mark in the Old Testament, here you could call it a seal. It's the same thing. A mark and a seal. The seal and the mark. One is a seal for God. The other one's a seal for the enemy, which would be Satan. It's, it's almost like if you're going to receive a seal of God, it's because you're worshiping the Father and His image. If you receive the seal of the beast, it's because you're receiving the seal of the father of lies and his image. Father in his image, father in his image. If you worship either of them, you're going to receive either of their seals. It's proof that you worship either one. What kind of proof could that be? Well, you're obedient to their commandments. Either one. If you're obedient to their commandments, it's proof that you're obedient to the one by whom you want the seal. Now, let's bring this home for a moment. Let's understand that in Revelation 14, verse 1, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000. By the way, the word lamb is symbolic, okay? And the 144,000 is symbolic. The seal, which is the Father's name, is symbolic. It's not really his name, like Jehovah on your forehead. It is his character in your life, your forehead. So all of this is symbolic. You can see that it's always symbolic in this context. But the point is that the Father's name, his, what is this name? What does it mean? It's the character. It's the authority. It is the surname or name, okay? And so when you have the Father's character, you have the Father's authority in your forehead, it's because you have chosen 
You have chosen to follow God and follow him alone. And so for me, this is absolutely beautiful because what we have seen is that Christ is the one that was sealed. That's the foremost important person that has been sealed. And if Christ is in you, you're sealed as well, right? It's the angels that will seal God's people. It's the spirit that does that sealing. Now, that doesn't mean that the angels are the spirit. The angels are not the Holy Spirit. The angels are filled with that spirit. And the angels are the ones that bring you to the point where you also are filled with that same spirit. That doesn't mean the angels are the Holy Spirit. Absolutely not. What it means is... God has appointed not some phantasma, not a phantom, not a disembodied soul to float around and stamp foreheads of people that are going to be ultimately in heaven. What it means is God is using his angelic ministers to bring you to the same place the Son was brought to complete and full submission to God's will. And if you want that, as I do, then we will have the seal of God the name or character of God in our foreheads, just as Jesus did. That's what I want, and that's what I desire. So, really, the impartation of the seal of God, the impartation of the Spirit of God at the end of time, is also a ministry of the angels. That doesn't mean we praise the angels, we don't worship the angels, we don't pray to the angels. We simply recognize that God is using his son, angels, and people like me and you. If we can submit to that, if we can surrender to the will that God has for me, for you in our lives, and we can bring ourselves by our own choices, prayer, and God working with us, the co-working, if we can do that and be in concert with his will, this work will be finished sooner than later. I believe that and I want it. So today, let's pray again, asking God to bless us with the ability to fully, more fully understand this, to be brought into concert with his will, and ultimately be sealed with the name of our Father. Amen? Our Lord of heaven, I want to thank you that you've given us this opportunity to be able to think through some of the thoughts in the Bible. You have made it clear that the sealing is done upon your people by the Holy Spirit, which is through the ministration of the angels. And we thank you that you have shown us in Ezekiel 9 and Revelation 7 at the end of time in both those contexts that your people will be sealed. It will be your character, your authority in our foreheads, our, our lives. We will have made up our minds. And I ask that you help us to come to that place, to be submissive to you, willing to surrender, and able to understand your will for us. Thank you for this, and bless us, we pray, in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for the beautiful thought, uh, Pastor Daniel. Praise God. It just resonated in my mind that, that if the inspiration says that the ceiling is settling in truth, both intellectually and spiritually, then God leads us to that precious truth through the ministration of holy angels. Amen. So that we are established in that truth, immovable. Amen. Though it was a new, I have not looked at it in the sense that, uh, um, I mean, connecting those verses together with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Now it's beautiful to see that the truth in God's word can be looked at from different angles and we arrive at the same answer. Amen. And that's beautiful. Praise God. Thank you. I, that verse to me became alive oh. in this study. And so, yes, it, it, Ephesians 4 is a very important verse. <laughs> yes, Zechariah 4, that's it. Amen. Thank you, Junius. And Zechariah 3. Yes, that's right. Both of them. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, and um, the beauty of all this is that um, the Father is the one who seals us. So the praise is not to the angels. Um, we can just read one text, and that is um, John 6, 27, if you're able to cast it. Yes, that was the first one we studied. That was the very first word. Uh, we... yeah. uh, uh, so, and, and I'm just getting in now, and it's, it's good that you had some thought. Yeah, that, that was the first verse we looked at. That's a beautiful one. Thank you. It's beautiful to know it, that our, our Father seals us, but in his... Um, <clears throat> Sovereignty, which we can't question, which is um, 
uh, which is good, he decided that he'll use his angels in this work of sealing, which is his work. Amen. Always Christ being the ladder upon which the angels descend and ascend. And blessings to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. God bless you. Thank you. Here, here in Ethiopia, we have had uh, a lot of time upon this stealing and the seal, uh, and stealing the ladder. Uh, so that's really very interesting. Look, the, the law of the commandment or the law of God is sealed, and the, the Son of God is sealed. The Son of God is holy, the law of God is holy. And also, those who have to be sealed, like the Son of God, like the law of God, the character of God, the character of the Father have to be uh, seen in them. Because of Christ in you, the hope of glory, neither the character of God in you, that is even his law, how they are connected together. So if uh, last service, the Adventist Service School said that, we are sealed not by the Holy Spirit, but Holy Spirit sealed us.